Welcome, everybody. Welcome to DevReach 2011. This is actually the sixth DevReach that we have done. And we wanted to welcome you and thank you for growing the community and growing the conference. I am Steve Forte. I think most of you have seen me before opening up DevReach or trying to pronounce certain things in Bulgarian, which will remain nameless. And I'm the Chief Strategy Officer of Teleric, the primary sponsor of this show. Teleric has sponsored DevReach all six years. This is the sixth year of DevReach. So we sponsored the first five years, and we're definitely sponsoring the next five years. DevReach is a core representation of our values at Telerik. We care about developers, and we care about the community. So that's one of the main reasons why we're sponsoring DevReach here today. I wanted to just say something about the audience. When Martin and Telerik started DevReach six years ago, we were in a small little hotel uh, close to the airport, maybe about 150 people maximum. Anyone here from that original DevReach? Wow, in the back, five, six people. Anyone here come to all six DevReaches? Awesome, there's a special prize for you. Um, I'm not sure what it is, but there's a special <laughs> prize for you. <laughs> Might be one of the beautiful Bulgarian women in blue shirts. <laughs> Okay, just real quickly, is here's a map, and we have attendees here at DevReach from 21 different countries, or maybe 22 different countries, and all throughout Europe as attendees. And we also have people coming from far and wide to present you to conference material. All the speakers traveled from Europe, from the United States, as far away as places like Hong Kong. So we have speakers coming from three different continents and 10 different countries. Speakers that are regional directors, Microsoft MVPs. We also have book authors, prolific bloggers. So we have a tremendous amount of rock star speakers to give you great content. Speaking of the content, we have a tremendous amount of technology going on these days. And what we are doing is we're taking all that technology and we're boiling it down to five tracks. And we're going to give you all of this great content but we're, we're really focusing mostly on DevReach based on your feedback from years past is stuff that can get you started today. So you'll be able to work through the code you see today and bring it back to the office on Wednesday. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Martin Kuloff, the founder of DevReach, someone who needs very little introduction. Thanks, Steve. You're welcome, Martin. Thank you everyone for being here. It's uh, really my pleasure to see you all again. And thanks Steve for the great intro. Steve is one, one of the guys who have been speaking at DevReach for six years in a row. So I keep coming back. Please applause for that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right. So we have, we have today, we have prepared for you different channels for communication. Yes. And I would really like to, to start using these channels because this is the only way we can reach you. We don't want to spam you with email and nag you all the time. Just use the channel so you can, you, we can get in touch and we can share and communicate together. Use the hashtag of DevReach. We have a pretty cool um, kind of a tweet board that you can see it around. So everything that you tweet will come over to the tweet board. Also, uh, we have prepared different prices for you. If you quote or retweet something of uh, DevReach posts, then you get a chance to win a cool award. So that's, that's really nice, and we would like to get engaged much more into this social, social in, in kind of interaction. So conferences, besides the great content that Steve told you about, it's all about networking and having fun. And this is what, what is my experience in conferences, is really to have fun and get introduced to people. So I, I would kindly urge you to, to do that also. We have, of course, community. This, and the community has been always my primary talk during this opening. When we started DevReach, we had like two or three user groups. Now we have eight of them. Some of them are not so active, but some of them are really active. And it's actually up to you to make them active even more. So try to attend these, these user groups meetings. Subscribe to the community uh, booth that we have here today. And hey, give a big applause to Microsoft Student Partners who are doing this community booth this year. So 
Go to the community booth, register, or you can register online at the register.sofiadev.net, and then you'll get a little more information about what we are doing. If you don't like it, you can unsubscribe at any time, of course. Also, big thanks to our sponsors. We have a lot of sponsors this year. They make the show happening. Of course, big thanks to Tarek, who is doing this for six years, and uh, he's uh, who are the, our, uh, the main and the major organizer of this event. So without any further delay, I'll get to the word back to Steve so he can talk a little more. I'll talk a little more. <laughs> Okay, one quick announcement is those of you who did not register and have your badge, um, either at the break, like at the lunchtime break or the coffee break later in the afternoon, please go and register and get your badge because the, the beautiful young ladies with blue t-shirts will not let you in the rooms if you do not have your badge. So please uh, get your badge and register for the event. And, for the feedback. Yes, and um, what will happen is we're looking for your feedback. Every year we collect the feedback. So please submit your feedback. And of course, keeping with tradition, there'll be a great prize. If well, You have to give the feedback to get the prize. So what I want to do is what we have done is we've built the conference based on your feedback in previous years. You've told us it's the type of content you want, the type of format you want. So based on your feedback, we've went and did a structure to two days of worth of keynotes. And we have our first keynote today in just, in just a minute or two. We'll bring Scott Hanselman on stage to talk about Lego and the Microsoft Web Stack of Love. It's a fabulous talk. You'll enjoy it a lot. Then we're going to have a quick 10-minute break. Just enough for you to stretch up, go like this, go, uh, take some pictures, send some tweets about DevReach and all that other fun stuff. Say how great, how, how good time you're having and kind of make all your friends at the office who are not at DevReach very jealous. Please use the DevReach hashtag. And um, don't leave the room though, okay? So just stay here for, we're just gonna have like 10 minutes where we just switch over the audio and the video, give the speakers time to transition. We'll bring Jesse Liberty on to tell you what's new with Windows Phone 7. And Putting a break like that in the keynote was based right on your feedback from last year. So you can directly influence how we run the conference by giving us your feedback. Tomorrow, we're going to have a keynote starting at 9 o'clock. I know that's tough, but Tim Huckabee always is very entertaining and always very informative. And Tim Huckabee will do a great job tomorrow. So without any further ado, I'd like to bring up my friend Scott Hanselman to the stage. Scott is the uh, Principal Program Manager, Community Architect at Microsoft Corporation. He has been, um, he likes to do crazy things like that. And, um, help me out. <laughs> you need some help? And uh, Scott has been speaking around the world for well over 15 years, I would say. And um, like that. Scott and I, I think this is the fourth continent now that we're speaking at a conference together. Yes, Antarctica.net is next. Antarctica.net. I've run the marathon in Antarctica, so I don't think you'll be doing that. Yeah, I think you'll be showing off now. just showing off now. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to hand it over to Scott. Let's give a warm Sophia welcome for Scott Hanselman, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Hello. That's, see, they warned me about you guys. They said that the Bulgarians were quiet, not like the Belgians, but still quiet. And they said that I would say, hello, and they would say, crickets. <laughs> and they said, well, I said well, can't they be excited? Can't they be like Stephen Forte? Can't they be like, woo It's my Stephen Forte impression. Is that, is that pretty accurate? All right. My name is Scott Hanselman. Thank you very, very much for letting me come here. And big thanks to Telerik for uh, inviting me. And also, let's just make sure that everyone understands that I really appreciate that Telerik has supported me in my podcast, Hansel Minutes. If you have listened to the show, I hope you like it. And if you haven't listened to the show, I hope you do. But I will say this, that if it wasn't for Telerik's support, there would be no Hansel Minutes. So big hand for Telerik for making that happen. Now, I'm going to talk about the uh, Microsoft Web Stack of Love. Uh, that is not the official marketing term for the Web Stack. Uh, I made that up because there's no Microsoft marketing people here to tell me that it's wrong. Are there? And then we're not streaming live, right? So my boss can't see this. Yes, it's called the Web Stack of Love, in fact. I've decided to name it that. 
Um, I'm sure you're familiar with our new org chart. I'm just kidding. You heard, though, that there was a little bit of a reorg at Microsoft. You know what Scott Goo moved around? People thought this was a bit, of, a bit of a thing of concern. They were worried, well, Scott Goo is, has moved. What, is, uh, what does this mean for the company? Where did Scott go? All right, well, let me just explain the org chart to make it clear. So Scott moved to Azure. There's Balmer, and then there's Scott. And then there's Xbox, and then a bunch of other stuff. <laughs> I don't care about that stuff. And then under Scott are all the angle brackets. So anything involved in sending an angle bracket over HTTP is Scott. So in fact, he took all of ASP.NET and IIS and like pruned that branch and then carried us over to Azure so that IIS and ASP.NET and WCF and Azure are all the same group, all the angle brackets in one place. So it's not that Scott went anywhere, it's that we all went over there with him. Now a number of people very kindly tweeted, maybe Scott Hanselman will be in charge now. Maybe he can run .NET. Maybe Scott Hanselman can run Visual Studio. While that's extremely flattering, and I do appreciate the vote of support, I want to make it extremely clear where Scott Hanselman fits into the org chart. All right. A refresher, Balmer, Goo, Elves, Angle Brackets. Another Scott who is not me. Yet another Scott, not me. The janitor happens to be named Scott. I work for him. <laughs> I am nowhere near Scott Goo and the org chart. When I call Scott Goo, I say, hey, Scott, this is Scott. And he, <laughs> he says, which Scott? And I work for the janitor. Oh, that guy. I like to think my relationship with Scott is a little different. I like to think that we're just like best of friends and we call each other like late at night and we just kind of like sit on the phone and we hear each other breathing. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, Scott, you hang up. No, you hang up. <laughs> OK, let's count to three. We both hang up. One, two, three. You didn't hang up. <laughs> oh, Scott. I love this man. Scott Goo. The Goo. His Gooness. Or, sir. I wanted to go and you know, do something, like put a halo around this man's head, because he hired me. The man is an angel. So I went out and I Googled with Bing for uh, a halo to put on his head, like a clip art halo. But the halo that I found wasn't exactly the halo that I needed. So that's the best I could come up with <laughs> to just express how I feel about Scott Goo. <laughs> My relationship with Scott Goo is complicated. I, I like to feel like it's like this. I'm worried that it may be more like this. <laughs> but one day, one day. All right, we've got a lot of cool software that's been going on at Microsoft lately. You may have noticed that we're releasing stuff more often, but we're releasing things in a little bit smaller size. I like to use the Lego terminology, the idea of building blocks or building bricks or construction sets. Because in the past, I felt like the things that Microsoft released were too, too large, too unwieldy. They required you to, to buy in to a whole way of thinking. And if you wanted to use WCF, you had to get the WCF religion. And if you use WCF, then that's different than using ASP.NET, and that's different from using SharePoint. And, getting the things to snap together like Lego bricks was hard. But lately, we've been releasing things like MVC3 with lots of different points of extensibility, MVC scaffolding, open source, IS Express, small, snappable. It's used in both Visual Studio and Web Matrix. SQL Compact Edition, letting you use databases without paying a license for SQL. NuGet, which is huge. I hope people are using NuGet. What a great way to get your Lego pieces and bring them down and snap them together. 
the Entity Framework 4.1, which I called the Magic Unicorn Edition of Entity Framework. All of these small, snappable components, and I'm going to talk about a number of these and others, as well as show you some features in the next version of Visual Studio that maybe you haven't seen before. Now, often with Microsoft products, you have a vision. You have an idea. Well, I'm going to build this, and it's going to be awesome. And the, the, the spec is amazing, and the, the vision for what I'm going to build with Microsoft products and the, the toolkit that Microsoft gives me. But inevitably, it ends up looking slightly different from what I expected. And I'm never sure who to blame. I blame Microsoft. Uh, maybe I blame another product at Microsoft. Often I go to the community and I'll get different open source projects and bring those in. Hopefully I'll have time to show you a number of those. Sometimes when I'm in the community and spending time with everyone, the local Microsoft guy shows up and he looks a little different from the rest of the community. You might be able to spot your Microsoft guy as he tries to sneak into the community and mess with you. Let's take a look at a number of new features in Visual Studio, in the editor, in web forms, in NuGet. Um, I'm going to have just a huge parade of demos that will hopefully keep you entertained and give you something to think about uh, today. And actually, you know, let me do this. One of the other things I want to cover, though, is that I'll show you some things that we're going to release in the next version of Visual Studio, but there's a lot more coming, okay? There's a lot more coming. And the, the, the story that I want you to, 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 to hear and to understand is that we get it more. We hear you. I've only been at Microsoft for, I think it'll be four years this year. And I still think of myself as a new person. A lot of people think I live in Seattle. I actually don't. I live about four hours south, about, I think about 300 kilometers south of Seattle, outside the Redmond reality distortion field. So from my, uh, my position outside the field, I'm able to, uh, you know, manipulate things and work with people like Phil Hack and Scott Gu and Damien Edwards and Eric Porter and all these great community guys that you know that are also new Microsoft people who are passionate about open source and making things fit together. So we've taken a little bit of a different strategy with the next version of Visual Studio. We've looked at the top 25 features that people have asked for. Some of them are big, but most of them are small. Sometimes people have described working with Visual Studio as death by a thousand cuts, tiny, tiny cuts, because it's little hiccups, little speed bumps as you're doing your job that's kind of slow you down. So we put up a user voice site. Perhaps you've used user voice. You can check out the ASP.NET user voice site at ASP.NET.UserVoice.com. And of the 25 features, 23 of them are done, and two of them, the ones that are not done, I think actually can be got in the community. One's going to be under consideration, one's in the community. So here's just some examples of the kinds of stuff. Startup performance faster. Project solution compatibility, I'm going to show you that. You can open up projects from Visual Studio 2010 in 2011 and then open them up again in 2010. You can round trip. This means that one or two people on your team can upgrade to the latest version and not break everyone else on the team. Really, really big deal. One of the top things that people ask for. IIS Express is the default. Things like JavaScript unit testing, we didn't do that one, but you can get that in the community. Compilation is faster, multi-proc, out-of-proc com compilation. Lots and lots of stuff, all done. Everything with a checkbox got done. Things like CSS pre-processing for less and SAS and CoffeeScript, you can get that from Mindscape. They've got a free community thing called the Web Workbench. So every one of the things that people wanted done is getting done. And for the things that aren't, you can find lots and lots of stuff in NuGet. We're going to change the way that we ship a lot of software. In the next version of Visual Studio, we're going to do two interesting things that I think you're going to care about. First, we're going to ship a bunch of new features, and we're going to ship a number of them as NuGet packages. Some will be pre-installed, so when you say file new project and bring up an MVC project, it'll in fact have a bunch of NuGet packages. NuGet, of course, is our .NET package manager. Those packages are going to be pre-installed, which means that when jQuery gets updated, you'll just update your project directly. But we're also going to start releasing some new features of ASP.NET in NuGet itself. So for example, the, the new bundling and minification stuff that I'll show you is actually going to be released not with Visual Studio, but rather 
in NuGet. That'll allow us to make it more updatable, to get community feedback, but it also means that if you, one of you or many of you are open source uh, project owners, that our projects and your projects are peers now. Our projects are going to ship in NuGet the same way that yours will. So we're going to make competition a little bit more fun. And you will be a peer to us. And even things like bundling and minification, if you already have a bundler or a minifier, you'll be able to plug in to ours. We're trying to make the Lego pieces snap together more cleanly. These are just a few of the things that are in NuGet. Is the, is the light following me? Is there like a... That's so cool. Like, that's not a computer. I can tell there's like a guy up there who's actually trying to keep me. <laughs> awesome. All right. Ready for a parade of demos? Let's see the demos. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that would have been awesome, though, huh? All right, we're going to see lots of demos. We're going to see demos of the editor features. Do you guys ever see the movie, uh, Carriage Return the Dragon? No? I showed that to Phil Hack, and he's like, is that line feed the dragon? I was like, Enter the dragon. What is wrong with you? Enter the dragon. And Phil was like, no, it should be slash r slash n the dragon. I'm like, no, you idiot. That's carriage return line feed the dragon. That is not right at all. I'm going to show you web forms demos. And Phil was like, oh, this is zero with airbender. No, maybe if there was one airbender, then it would be the zero with airbender, but it's the last airbender. It's the... What's wrong with you, Phil? We'll look at web API stuff. You guys saw Inception over here, right? It's a great show, huh? Inception was fantastic. You know the, what Inception was about, right? Inception was about if you run a VM inside another VM, it gets really slow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you clap for that, right? See? You guys, you guys are evil. We've been working for years on Visual Studio 2000 and whatever we're going to call it, and we got like 25 new features, and you laugh on the cheesy Inception joke. <laughs> Bulgarians, ah, uh. bakshish, bakshish. Eh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, let's play. Um, okay, let's do this. Parade of demos. This, uh, so this is an application that I wrote many, many years ago that I call um, Tweet Sandwich. There's a local sandwich shop that uh, I would go to. And I wanted to be able to tweet my order. There's a lot like a small business. So this is a .NET 335 application. Let's me tweet my order, and then they would receive the tweet and then print out, print out the tweets. And I would make, make sure I just say, give me my usual sandwich, and then I'll let you know. So if I right click on this inside of Visual Studio 2000 and whatever, I don't know what they're going to call it. I don't know what year comes after this year. So I also don't know what the next version of Windows will be called. So I'm referring to it as Windows 7.1 plus 1 minus 0.1. Because I don't know what number comes after 7, and it's not obvious at all to any one of us. Visual Studio 2010 plus unknown round integer. And notice when I click on properties in Visual Studio, I've got a lot of choices. This is really important. I can work on my .NET 3.5 application in Visual Studio 2000 and something, and it will work. I can use .NET 2 applications. I can use .NET 4.5 applications. .NET 4.5 is going to be an add-on to .NET 4, so it's going to be an improvement. It's not going to be a separate CLR. I'm really, really working hard to get these guys to understand semantic versioning. So the next CLR version of .NET would be presumably 5. 4 5 is an improvement over 4. It's, it's an add-on to 4, but it's not its own CLR. 
So here I've got a 3.5 application, and I'm running it inside of 2000 and or what a Visual Studio 11 developer preview. Okay, this is the PDC build, and let's close it here and open up 2010. Do, do, do. And then in 2010, I'll open the same exact project. And it works. Oh, that's 2011. It's too many, too many. Ah! All right, that's 2010. That's what that's for, by the way. You know that feature? Window. Ah! All right. Okay, so here's the same exact project in 2010. Prove it just by showing that, oops, showing that, two th that uh, .NET 4.5 is not there. This was the number one feature that people asked for. It's called round tripping. This means you'll be able to have multiple people in your organization on different versions of Visual Studio. Everything will keep working. But the really interesting part for me as the owner of a little Twitter client that's written in .NET 3.5 is I want to be able to keep working on my older projects while also taking advantage of the new features in the editor. So there's a lot of IDE specific features that I care about that I want, but I still maybe have a .NET 2 or ASP.NET 2 application that I want to work on. So the editor features I'm going to show you in CSS and JavaScript and all that new stuff, those things are still going to work for older projects because they are Visual Studio improvements. So this means that you should have less of a reason to uh, you know, have your boss say no, I don't want you to use 2010. So round tripping, really, really important. All right, so let's do this. We'll go back over to this is 2011. You'll notice that it pretty much looks the same, and I don't like toolbars, so I'm just going to get rid of them all. There we go. There we go. So here I've got a little paint application. This is a basic little silly app. It just kind of, yay, doesn't really do anything. What's interesting about this application, though, is that there is an object hierarchy. Over in the Solution Explorer, this is the new uh, 2011, uh, Dev 11, I don't even know what they call the thing anymore. Next version of Visual Studio uh, um, IDE. So here in Solution Explorer, we've got a couple things. First, you see we've got a search box. So I can search for things within here and find my files quickly. But when I open up something like, here we go, Rectangle Paint, this is a file. Notice this. I've actually got objects and methods within that. Then I can click on those and I'm using just the cursor keys and moving around in my source like this. So I can navigate through a large code base really, really quickly using just the keyboard. We want to make sure that people aren't uh, thinking it's just about mice at this point. And then I can do things like this. Let's say, show me uh, derived types, maybe. Let's say, like, derived types of the paint object. So here are types that are derived in the object hierarchy from paint object, OK? Now, as I'm moving around in my Solution Explorer, notice that occasionally uh, tabs are opening and closing. Let's do this. I'm going to close this app, switch over to 2010, open up the same application. And as I'm moving around, I'm just kind of reading some code, I'm learning about code, and then I say, well, I want to see that. Right click, go to definition, I want to see color, go to definition. Um, I formatable, go to definition. I'm just kind of you know, looking at my code. See what's happening with my tabs at the top there. It's kind of turning into this big kind of tabby mess. All I'm doing is exploring my project, but I've already got to figure out what's going on. So then at some point, I will declare window bankruptcy and just close all documents and go back to the two that I care about. Right? We've all done this. This is what I talk about with a death by a thousand cuts. Another. Um, American colloquialism that we use is called boiling a frog. Do you guys know this one, boiling a frog? 
How do you boil a frog? The way you boil a frog is you put him in the cold water and then you turn the water up slow. The frog doesn't know it's happening. But if you take a frog and you throw him in hot water, then he's gonna go, hey, hey, this is not okay. The frog would sound just exactly like that. Hey, what's that about? Knock it off. Same thing with Visual Studio. You use it for years and years and years and you don't realize you're being boiled and suddenly all these tabs are going. You don't know, you just say close all windows and you move on with your life. But if you look at it with fresh eyes, like the team has tried to do, you realize that that's really not the way to do it. So they put a lot of thought into little features that you wouldn't even know that you are using. But let's do this. I'm going to open up two files here. I've got two tabs open, right? You see, I can pin them, of course, which is nice. But I've got two things open, but then I'm going to start exploring. OK, right click, go to definition. Let's go to color. Look at iFormatable. I format provider. What's happening? We've got this non-persistent tab over here. Notice that I'm exploring my source code in, a, in the way that I always do, and it's not opening up a new tab. It's using this temporary tab. And if I go back over here, this tab has nothing to do with it. I want to look at like lists, view definition. But then if I say, oh, a list is important to me, I'm going to promote that tab to what's called a durable tab. I want to make that tab over here. The point is, though, I can wander around in my project, and here I am just using the keyboard, and take a look at what's going on without cluttering up all my tabs. That's just a tiny example of the kind of uh, features that they're putting in so that uh, frogs don't feel like they're getting boiled. Let's go back to paint object. I'm going to right click and say, show me derived types. So here I've changed the context for my solution explorer to show just this stuff. Now, you're probably familiar with being able to pick up a window and drag it to another monitor. You can drag things out of Visual Studio uh, 2010. But you can actually go like this now. So now I've got a solution explorer here and a solution explorer here. So let's go and pretend I have two monitors, two tiny, tiny monitors. And let's say I want to take paint object and then pick it up, drag it outside Visual Studio, and put it over here. So now on my other monitor, this is not another instance of Visual Studio. It's another instance of the editor. But that editor has its own solution explorer, and that solution explorer has its own context. So I can have business objects over here, data access over here, my web over here, and start setting up these workspaces where the context is maintained between them, and then explore the different things I want to see. And notice that it has its own tabs and its own tab well. This is like a little feature that once you've seen it, you'll say, how did I live without this? I want to use this all the time. There's dozens and dozens of cool little features like this in Visual Studio uh, Dev Preview that I hope that you check out. Unless Bulgarians don't have more than one monitor, and then all of that time was wasted. And uh, we, have no, we have only one monitor here. Why are you showing me this play? I don't care about this feature. I, I can't do an accent here, so I don't know what that was. That was, uh, that was Borat? Is that what that was? I don't think that was Borat. <laughs> Have one monitor. Why you show me this feature? No? Yeah. It's nice, yes. Huh? Yeah. So let's get out of paint and let's go in here and let's take a look at a, uh, a web application. Still in the developer preview. All right. Let's open up. So I'm sitting right here. Uh, now, there's some features that are fun to show in 2011, the next version. Um, that already exist in 2010. It'll be interesting if you guys can tell which features are new and which features aren't. I think that the Word team had the same problem. They had uh, features that they, would they, they, they made more obvious in the new version of Word, and everyone's like, oh man, that's an amazing new feature. And they're like, yeah, that's been in there for like 10 years, but you didn't know it. You guys know about control comma, right? Control comma, CSS, let me say style, dot site control comma about control comma home, uh, home controller head context see how I can actually say like um, register hyper link that's how you navigate around new feature or old feature 
Like, only a couple people knew that. I've had people, like, see this and freak out. They've seen that, oh, that's amazing. I was reborn when I saw a control comma, they say to me. My whole life opened up. And, oh. I went to DevReach, they showed me control comma, and then after that, it was all a blur. It was so wonderful. Thank you, Microsoft. Thank you, Northwind Database. No? Too soon? All right. Do you guys have these um, commercial like advertisers, these hucksters on TV? They're like, but wait, that's not all. Let me show you another great feature. <laughs> I feel like the local Microsoft guys always like that, you know? Let me, let me stop, let me, let me drag a data grid and show you. This will be amazing. I'll drag this data grid. Look, Northwind database. Hey, but please, stop, stop with your applause. Please, please, don't applaud. I don't, no, no, no. No, I don't, I don't want your pity. I don't want your pity. <laughs> that felt good, actually. All right. All the editors in Visual Studio are different. CSS, JavaScript, C Sharp, all the editors are different, but they're subtly different. Some editors had features that others didn't. And people, people didn't really realize it until they want the feature. And then they kind of wonder, wait a second, why don't I have regions in CSS? You know, why can't I go like region whatever and then end region? So we've added things like regions, we've added collapsing to CSS, we've added um, uh, collapse, we have collapsing region. So let's do like a collapsing region. I could say like, just do, oops, comment, region, yay, regions. Identity. Uh, I warned you about my typing. It's not going to be pretty. Right, and then the regions totally don't work. And I'm like, what? Why is that not working? And then I realize that the problem is up here. Right? Isn't that cool? Those are, that's like one example of like a little tiny feature that now once you've seen it, then you realize that we've cleaned everything up across all editors. We've got parity across them. But wait, that's not all. Let me show you this crazy feature. Color. All right, let's just make sure. <gasps> what was that? Ah! <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. It's nice, yes. Hang on, that's. But that's not all. Ooh. Huh? I'm going to do that. That's the rest of the talk. I mean, I'm going to do that for an hour. Seriously, huh? Isn't that cool? And these are actually picked from the document itself, eh? Shiny. Cool. So I'm glad you like that. Thank you. That's cool. <laughs> A smattering of applause. Thank you. Thank you. The other thing that we're doing is we've got folks like, uh, like Mads Christensen who worked on this stuff. Mads is the author of the very popular blog engine.net. And Mads looked at developer workflow. That's a fancy way of what do you do all day? for things that are uh, slowing you down. Here's an example. Does, uh, Stephen Forte, do you know exactly how to do font face in uh, you know, HTML5 font face uh, in a cross-browser way in CSS from, from memory? Go ahead. No, all right. Font face. Oops, I'm sorry, hello Stephen. Stephen, do you know font face, boom. Yes, it's nice. Check this out. Media. Boom. Yeah, it's hot. Bunch of stuff like that. Um, ooh, ooh, ooh. How about uh, Mozilla keyframe? No, what's the keyframes one? Keyframes. Uh, what's the other one? See all these? Well, there's a bunch of these things. Where's the one? How do you do border radius? I always forget that one. Border. Border, bottom, right, radius, boom. Boom, 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 boom. 
Stuff like that is very repetitive and very boring. They've gone and put in snippets for all that stuff. And if I put in a hyphen, check this out, you guys. Opera. For both of you that use opera, you're going to be really excited. <laughs> But in all seriousness, this is the kind of stuff that people want, right? You want to be able to do this. So we've got vendor-specific prefixes, and we're going to keep them updated. We've got Opera, we've got Mozilla, we've got Microsoft, all in there. We've got snippets for stuff. We've got uh, all the, uh, oh, oh, here's another thing. Check this out. So uh, I don't know if you guys do, do like, CSS hacks. Any, any um, CSS hack type people around here? Let me switch out. Uh, this, is a, this is a popular CSS hack. So we actually know that that's a hack. That's a, that's a known and useful and often used hack. That's not like technically correct. But because it's like one of the top 10 hacks that's used in CSS, rather than warning you all the time and bugging you in the, edit, in the, in the uh, errors, we know that that's a hack and we respect that that hack. Even things like, uh, you know, things like this. We'll respect that that's a known hack and we won't say that that's invalid CSS. Those are like the real world things that we're doing to make things easier, which is pretty awesome. There are dozens and dozens of things inside of uh, CSS to make life a little bit easier. Yes! <laughs> this is the part, ah, I love that part. So yeah, so that's hot too, cool. JavaScript, same kind of thing. We went through the JScript uh, editor and made sure that we've got the same features that you're used to in all your other editors. So you've got collapsing and all those kind of things. One of the most irritating things that I found about using the JavaScript editor was I always wanted to right click and go to definition. And now you can. Yeah, this is little stuff. Check, check this out, guys. See how there's no jQuery mentioned in here? But I get help for jQuery, right? Q. Uh, and I can go like append to or whatever. And then I can right click and go to definition. And now I'm inside of the jQuery stuff. Two things. You can go into tools options and you can set references and you can say, I want these references to always be available because how often have you seen the Microsoft guys show you how VS doc files work and how you can get JavaScript help, but it never works when you leave the demo, right? And he's like, oh, well, just put 15 comments at the top of your JavaScript file. Just let us know about all these different things, right? So now we have two ways to do that. We have a references file, which is implicit references. You can say, always show these JavaScript files, or you can go, Tools, options, environment, JavaScript, text editor, thingy, something, Tuesday, environment, references, blah, 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 blah. And you could set it there. But I don't remember exactly where that is, so I'm going to use a new feature of the Visual Studio. Look at that. And I just said, hey, jQuery VS Doc is something you want to use. So that's Quick Launch. Quick Launch is hot. And it actually has a, um, uh, a shortcut key, which is like so intuitive. It's like control plus two pixels going like that. <laughs> so what is that? Control, there we, there we go. Okay, font, compiler. No, all right worth a try. But you get the idea. All right? We've also, like we said, we've got outlining and all that kind of stuff as well. Much, much, much smarter editor. So parity across all those editors. Let's look at some web forms. Any web forms people here? Come on, don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. I, don't, I know there's an MVC guy that's sitting next to you and he's like, don't you raise your hand. You're dead to me. You know that everyone's like, oh, we have to, we have to switch to MVC. It's the new thing. No, it's not the new thing. It's a, it's a new thing. It's not the new thing. We're going to make sure that you guys are really clear that it's about ASP.NET. It's not about web forms. 
It's not about MVC, it's about ASP.NET. I want to make sure that like that is crystal clear. That's how the stack is. You know, I think only about 10 or 15% of people are using MVC. There's a lot of really good work happening in web forms. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time showing you web form stuff because web form people exist and web forms matters because it's about ASP.NET. I'm going to also show you hybrids, hybrid applications because it's about ASP.NET. You can use web forms and MVC and web pages all in the same app. They're all just tools in the toolbox. So please, please, please do not feel like or tell your bosses or whatever that you have to pick one or the other. You pick the one that makes you happy. You guys know the CodePlex website, right? Everybody knows CodePlex? That's half MVC, half web forms. There are pages that are MVC, there are pages that are web forms because some of the reporting and charts and graphs pages make sense to be web forms. Some of the lighter weight stuff makes sense to be MVC. Pick the right tool for the job. So let's look at some web forms because web forms is awesome. I want web forms pride. No? There's like two guys. Yeah, web forms. All right, maybe you guys are, maybe all, all of Bulgaria uses uh, MVC, right? No? Be proud of your data grid. Drag that data grid. <laughs> Use a table inappropriately. It's okay. <laughs> All right, let's do this. See this button up here? Use doc type. I've got a note. What is that doing there? I need a sad trombone for my sad trombone because the guy turned the audio off. That makes this, there it is. stands out, doesn't it? Like, what are, you, what are you doing there? It's like someone showing up at a party. You're not supposed to be here. Hey, Bing is freaking me out today. That's cool. You guys know about IE6 countdown, right? Counting down to the death of IE6. 9%. Hey, rock on Finland. Cool. Dark China. What are you guys doing? What the hell's wrong with you guys? Where are you guys? Well, I'm sure you're doing fine. <laughs> At least you're not China. They're messing it up for everybody. All right. One of the things, uh, this, th this, this drop down was a stupid drop down. It never should really exist. What that drop down should do is it should automatically figure out what my HTML uh, is based on the doc type. So if I hit use doc type, it takes a look at my page and my um, master page and figures it out. See, I click use doc type and it knows HTML5. So I'm here now in my uh, about page, which has a site master, which uses HTML5. And then we automatically switch and show the right IntelliSense and the right snippets based on what you're doing. So here we are in, uh, in web forms and we can do uh, HTML5. Um, we've also done a number of things in, uh, that are, that are kind of like smarter things. Like, for example, if you go, like, say, meta, character set, we've put the most common character sets there already. Little stuff like that, just to make it easier so you don't have to remember things. If I'm sitting in my site master and my doc type is set, I can do things like audio, cool, file, enter. Video, even cooler. So I've got HTML5 snippets and support from inside here. But the other thing that we've discovered is that more and more people care about the code and not the designer. So I might want to go and do something like a grid view. And I don't want to switch into designer mode in order to bring up the designer. So now I don't have to. 
So now I can be an, a web forms programmer who cares about web forms and is excited about web forms but can do HTML5 and do designer stuff. So for component vendors, this means that this designer can be more important than whatever you end up putting on the screen because design view never looks like anything anyway. So this is for the web forms person that cares about the markup but also likes the productivity about web forms. So I'm doing all of that within here. I can also do things like, say, a div. See how the div lights up? Yeah? See, that's cool. That's not working at all. No, just kidding. But yeah, isn't that nice? Also, let's do this. Let's say, do that again. Button, button, tab. Cool, enter. On click equals psh, psh. create new event. Ooh. Oh, what's going on? Ah! There it is. And unnamed click. See? That didn't go as well as it could have. Did you get the idea? <laughs> on click equals. It actually knows it's there. So I can even wire up my clicks there, which is cool. All right. I can take a chunk of markup like this in web forms and right click. Yeah, that was, no, no, don't, don't, don't clap for them all, don't clap for them all. Clap when it's awesome, I don't need your pity claps. Uh, let's say input, tab, type, hey, look at all those awesome HTML5 types that no one supports. <laughs> Except for those guys with Opera. Good job, Opera. So we've got HTML5 uh, types. Let's look at this. Repeaters. One of the smartest things that we ever came up with is a repeater. One of the stupidest things we ever did was we left you on your own inside of the item template for a repeater. But check out line nine. Strongly typed repeaters. See, web forms doesn't suck. It doesn't. But we have to remember when web forms was made, it was a different web. So what we're doing is we're making an HTML5 smart markup friendly, smart developer friendly web forms. That's what I want you guys to take away. Strongly typed repeaters, lovely. Now, here's the awesome part. Check this out. But wait, that's not all. Here is a drop down list and a grid view. We've got a couple of bound fields. See where it says select method on line 16 there? What do you not see? There's no object data source. Not everyone wants to do things that way. Maybe you have a repository pattern and you're doing things that way. You have an entire repository, maybe one of your MVC apps is using, and you want this grid view to get its data from something like Git products. And maybe the drop down list will come from Git categories. That's all the markup. People always say that. Web forms markup can't be pretty and do cool stuff. That's, that's an example that it can't. Now, check out the code behind. See this here? Get products. So now I've got a grid view and I have get products feeding directly into my grid view with no intermediate, no object data source, passing in iQueryable. But what's the thing that we're always doing in web forms that's just so frustrating? Do you ever feel like Half the work you do in web forms is business logic, and the other half is dicking around with the request object. Something dot something equals parse int plus request dot form quote is it null? Don't know if it's null. Parse it to an int. Check for null. Da, da, da. It just feels like half my web forms applications are futzing around inside of the request object. Maybe it came from a control. Maybe it came from the query string. Oh, it's in a cookie. So I end up having 20 or 30 lines of. Blah, 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 blah. Monkey code, monkeys just slapping the keyboard, and then business logic. But how can I do this here? Well, check this out. Boom. 
Huh? Don't clap. Just drink it in. Just like Zen. Just like, oh, yes. <laughs> clapping on the inside. The sound of one hand clapping. <laughs> Putting those attributes. Now, where does this look familiar from? Where have we seen this before? Model binding. Remember how I said it's not about web forms, it's not about MVC, it's about ASP.NET. What's the number one feature in web forms that's so awesome that no one uses ever? Routing. You guys have had routing for three years. No one ever uses it in web forms. That's lame. It's not system.web.mvc.routing. It's system.web.routing. Model binding is now model binding. It's shared. Model binding is a thing that you can use. Web forms programmers have routing. You have model binding. You can make clean HTML5 applications. Be happy. Mix it up. Sorry, I'm like lecturing now, but I just feel strongly about that. So here, in a couple of lines, and this is nice too because we're using iQueryable. You can see that I'm just saying, go and add the where and go and add the, the sort. So, do, 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 what are we on here? Clean model binding. So this is the kind of stuff that Web Forms is good at. Having sortable, filterable grids in 20 lines of code. Paging, sorting, filtering. Harder to do in MVC. I'm all about MVC. I want to make sure you guys get that. But it's about picking the right tool for the job. And I don't want anyone to write off web forms. People are like, ah, oh, web forms is dead, blah, 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 blah. BS. You guys say BS here? You know what that means, right? It's not good. The other thing that people like, or want rather, is they want unobtrusive validation. So if I do a view source on this page here, we've got like a bunch of validators. I say view source. Look at all that. That's totally obtrusive. I don't think obtrusive is a word, but I just said it, I just made it a word. So this is totally obtrusive validation. More and more people are trying to move their JavaScript out of their pages and into libraries. So what I can do now is I can go and find unobtrusive validation. And I can change the mode to web forms. I can also do this in the, uh, in the web config. And let's look at that. Still works. View source. And what we're doing now is putting the validation code in HTML5 using jQuery unobtrusive validation. So you've got data hyphen val display is valid, data val, all those things like that. That means that there's no big pile of JavaScript at the bottom of the thing. We're going to be using jQuery to do that work. So each of those controls carries their validator. They can all be, of course, completely localizable. All I had to do was switch it, and I just lost a bunch of JavaScript at the, bunch, at the bottom of my page. It's now doing HTML5, and it still works on older browsers like, God help us, IE6, because it, uh, validation still works there, which is awesome. Now, request validation. You guys have done this before, right? This is where we go and we say, yada, yada, yada. You guys know the difference between blah, 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 and yada, 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 right? That's an Americanism. Do you know about this, Forte? Blah, 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 and yada. You guys watch Seinfeld, right? Blah, blah, blah is like, you know, I went out on a date with this girl. It was great. And, you know, blah, 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 and I went home early. I went on a date with this girl, yada, yada, yada. Breakfast was great. OK. So let's put some script in here. We've all seen this before, right? And what is the answer in web forms to fix that? To make it so one single control can receive uh, dangerous information. Turn off validation for the entire application. Of course. What a great idea. <laughs> Thanks, web forms. Ting. <laughs> I think that's a bad idea, Scott. Uh, pretty sure. 
All right, let's do this. I want to have like a little blogging control, a little widget right there. Let's use NuGet. I'm going to go in here. I'm going to right click. I'm going to say manage NuGet packages. If you're not using NuGet, please, it's amazing and awesome and wonderful. Uh, it's assuming the internet is up. And uh, I'm going to type in tiny MCE, which is a little rich text box looking deal. Do I have it installed already? That's a good question. Did I put it in there? Oh, I already have it in there. So I brought down tiny MCE apparently last night. How thoughtful of me. Tiny MCE is a little bit of a script that I want to stick up at the top of my page. I can do it in a couple of different places. I want to put Tiny MCE up there, but Tiny MCE is going to need jQuery. Now I could go and put a bunch of scripts up here. I could go and say script, blah, blah, blah. But sometimes I want to use the debug version of the script. Sometimes I want to use the, the CDN version. Sometimes I'm on SSL. Sometimes I'm not. I'm always messing around with scripts. I want to have a smarter script manager. So I'm going to go into the global ASAX. I'm going to take a look at this script manager. Take a look at line 19 and how that builds up. It says, hey, there's a thing called jQuery. And here's the path, but here's the debug path. It's not minified, but here's the CDN path and the CDN supports. SSL, but I only need to refer to it as jQuery. Let's make another one for tiny MCE. Doo -doo. Tiny MCE scripts, tiny MCE, MCE dot three dot four dot five dot ten, uh, tiny MCE dot two and I don't have a debug path, and I don't have a CDN, I don't have any of that stuff, and I don't like commas, so that's good. Does that look right? Let's find out. So I've, now I've told the script manager that there is this thing out there called Tiny MCE. And I might change the version, but I don't want to change it in 15 different places. Script manager, oops. I do do script, where's my script manager? Right down here. P colon script manager. Scripts, boom. Uh, script reference, and I actually don't want to use a path because I'm going to refer to my scripts by name, jQuery and tiny MCE. So now I've got some scripts. And I'm going to make, which is the text box, this text box here have tiny MCE. Script, tab, enter, do, 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 do. Open resig function de dupa close resig tiny mce init do do mode text areas beep boop do boop 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 cool close all that nonsense run it Someone screw up? What's going on? Did he? Oh, he knows what he's doing. Wow, I was worried. You just never know how these things are going to go. I mean, he's he's screwing around. He's had like six Coke lights. Who knows what the, what this man is capable of? I realize that was kind of a roundabout way to just say, add that attribute, but it's way more fun to do it that way. <laughs> I could hey, add this attribute, yay. But no, it's better. I added NuGet, I used the NuGet, I got a little open source thing, I did a little script manager stuff. I can automatically switch between the CDN or not using the CDN or the minified version or not minified version by these script resources. This is one of the things that WebForms is known for. Believe it or not, you think that uh, ASP.NET MVC was the first 
uh, programming model that we came up with that respects being dry, right? The really sad part about being dry and explaining dry on stage like this is that I have to say it many, many times and then explain that dry means don't repeat yourself, which becomes extremely ironic because now I've said dry like eight times plus I've defined it, which is not dry. But this means I can define my scripts in one place, change them in another place, and change it in the entire application. Except, a lot of times, uh, web forms people say, well, that's great, but in web forms, if I want to change a control out from, uh, let's say, a label to like a Telerik label, This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes brought to you by Teller Controls, the best controls in the area. <laughs> um, you have to go, if your boss says, yeah, change all the labels to this label or all these uh, date times to a Teller, it's, it's a huge hassle because you've got to go and copy that stuff around. Well, check this out. See this label? Web config. Boom. Tag mapping. I want all labels to become this label. Do you guys do this? You should do this. Do you do this? I hope you do this. It's good, eh? It's a nice, yeah? <gasps> so I've just changed all ASP colon labels to web application controls label. New feature, old feature? Really, really, really old feature that no one uses. New for 2011. No, that's an awesome feature. Nobody uses that feature. Web forms programmers should know about that. Tell people. Try to use that feature at work. Oh, man. Um, you want me to change all the labels to Telerik labels? Whoa. Um, yeah, probably two days. Um, I'm going to need to, you know, i got to focus on this. I'm going to work from home. And... Uh, Yeah, it was a grueling two days, boss, but you know, after Googling for like 16 hours, I found this new feature from Microsoft called tag mapping. It's awesome. We should PayPal Hanselman right away. Bundling. Let's make that a startup page. Bundling. Set start page. Run it. I'm going to do this one from... A competing browser. Ooh. Now, awesome is awesome. I use awesome things if I can use them. Okay, so that's 404s. We've got a folder here called styles. We've got style bundle and we've got style sheets in that bundle. Rather than asking for them by name, I'm going to ask for them by folder. and hope it works. Bastards. And then I will think, and I will pretend that I knew this, but I forgot. Don't tell anyone. I think it's like bundle, table, bundle, table, table dot, bundles. There you go. Do you guys play golf? No? What's the boringest Bulgarian sport? Do you guys do curling or anything? What's the boring? Bowling? No? Soccer? That's, that's a mean. What is wrong? Get him out of here! Burn the witch! Who said soccer was boring? Football? So this is where Hanselman goes, what the? What? That one? You're probably right. You want to come up here, help me out? No. I don't think so, man. I think that I'm just an idiot. It's more likely. Let's make sure the bundle's installed. Always have to have one demo go horribly, horribly wrong. Okay, so bundling's installed. Scripts, bundle one. Let's try that again. 
Ah, I'm freaking out. So, what's the definition of insanity? You know about that? Oh, scripts, right? What are you saying? Scripts, styles. No, that should work. Scripts slash bundle one. Definition of insanity is trying the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. <laughs> scripts, bundle one. If I start Googling for help, then we know it's like, it's bad. He needs help. What the hell? Compile. You think so? I don't know, man. <laughs> Damn it. Uh, do, do, do. Restart Windows, is that what you're saying? <laughs> Let's do this, shall we? Let's try this. Uninstall. Online. Bundling. Install. Close. Compile. Bless. Run. You know, and the thing is, this is the great thing about demos, is that one thing always goes like horribly, horrifically wrong. And um, the second I step off the stage, I will remember what the problem was. And then I won't be able to tell you. Just step, up, step down. <laughs> Applauding will not make me stop. I have to just, <laughs> all right. Epic fail. All right, so if bundling worked, which is something that, and may I just make one point in my defense before you all like tweet, it was really great until <laughs> I've lost all respect for Hanselman. I just want to point out the order of the zero and the one. Okay, all right, what bundling is supposed to do and uh, it'll be in NuGet, is actually clever. And I know I'm doing something stupid, and one of you will come up who's too shy to yell it out and tell me what I'm doing wrong. But the idea is very clever. What we do is we just take a request for a directory and automatically bundle that stuff up. So if you put a bunch of CSS files in a directory, it'll automatically, with a request to that directory, bundle and minify that stuff, which is cool. Rather than going and building up a bunch of complicated stuff, it automatically just figures it out. You can go and add hints and your own bundles and say, I want these bundles in these orders. Um, it knows the appropriate order of common scripts, so your um, you know, jQueries and jQuery UIs and things like that. Uh, but if you have scripts that need to be done in a certain order, you can either alphabetize them, put numbers in front of them, or teach the bundling system the order in which you want those scripts. And then by just dropping a file, whether it be CSS or JavaScript, into a folder, it will automatically bundle it. So I, uh, I don't know why that didn't work, and um, someone will tell me soon. Anyone? No? OK. Bummer. 0 0.1. 0 0.0.1. There was really no chance it was ever going to work, I think is what the point is. All right. <laughs> All right, let's do this. Let's get into even more fun stuff. Let's bring up Visual Studio. Who, who's played with Web API? A couple people know, no? All right, WCF, are you all, are you all appropriately afraid of WCF? Everyone has the, the fear? WCF has gotten a reputation as being big and scary and overly, um, overly complicated. One of the things that WCF is really known for is being kind of infinitely configurable. And that is both its weakness and its strength. But what the WCF team has done is they have created a new thing called uh, Web API by literally using the configurability of WCF to brain transplant about half of it. So believe it or not, they've simplified a restful layer and put that on top of WCF. So the core is WCF, which you should feel good about because it is known to be secure, it is known to be scalable, it is known to work extremely well, it's just known to be hard. 
But now Web API lets you do stuff like this. Let's say, here's JSON value. I've got a service contract, I say Web Invoke, and I just take a post. We're actually inside of an ASP.NET application. And I want to make sure that that's clear. I've talked a little bit about this slide. Just want to add that little bit on the side there, just to remind you that this is all just ASP.NET. I, I realize that when you say file new project, it feels like a fork in the road. It feels like it's like, okay, pick one. Web forms, MVC, what side are you on? I realize that's what the new project dialogue feels like. Pick a team. All blacks. Rah, rah. I think it should be like a checkbox. File new project, a little of this, a little of that, a little chicken sausage, a little French toast. But it's not. But this is the reality. So expect to have web pages and MVC and web forms and WCF all working together happily in the same application. So in this example, let's go ahead and just take a look at this. Let's, uh, let's debug this actually. You hear that? Was that the voice in my head? I thought it was. All right, let's take a look at this. Ansel man, add. Okay. We just used a little bit of JavaScript to post to this page. We've got a thing called JSON value. See this JSON contact? Let me zoom in a little bit. I'm going to grab this guy. Okay. Let's pin him down. Stop moving. Pin, pin, pin. Boosh. Ah, where'd you go? Here, right here. There he is. Stop moving. Hi, Mom. You guys know you can put comments on your watch windows? And then I want to grab JSON contact. I'm going to grab contact response. Put him right there. Actually, no. Let's put him down here. Okay, JSON contact. That's the JSON that came in on the post. Okay? I can actually you know, open that up and poke around and see all the goo that's in there. I can grab that and throw it into a dynamic. Name, Scott Hanselman. Then, do some stuff. And then I say new JSON object. And here I've got a dynamic. And see the JSON object? This is the response. Let's say that I go to the database, I do some stuff. See the contact response? It's a little bit of JSON right there. Now, see this here? That's a dynamic. Name. See the JSON? It's writing JSON dynamically. Hello. See that? Contact ID. And then I can return it. So look at that, five lines of code, it's actually going to turn into four. They're going to make it even simpler. Receiving JSON, dynamically pulling it apart, and then creating JSON and returning it really, really cleanly. These, um, see, look at that. That's the client side. Yay. See this dynamic? When you say, anyone using use dynamic? Dynamic is a joy. If I say dot, see? This operation will be resolved at runtime. People think dynamics living alongside statics is a really weird thing in .NET. But then I called Anders. No, I didn't really call Anders. He, doesn't, he has no idea who I am. So I was parked in front of Anders' house. I've been following him for a few days. <laughs> and I was like, hey, Anders, what's the deal with dynamic? It's like it's static, and C-sharp is static, and then we have this dynamic thing, and I can't get IntelliSense. What's going on? Why can't you figure that out? And he says, here, here's the deal. It's statically typed as dynamic. <laughs> so I was like, oh yeah, cool, thanks, totally. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But he's Anders. He made Delphi. It's freaking Delphi. Yes. So who am I to argue with him? This means that I can go and say poo and some more poo. And run it. Run it again. Do, do, do. Go totally off script. <laughs> like there was a script. <laughs> uh. Where's Fisher? There it is. Okay, check me out. Boo, boo. Boo. More poo. That's dynamic. It feels natural, right? There's a place for IntelliSense, there's a place for non-IntelliSense. WCF, 
Web API plus JSON value and dynamic all making that awesomeness possible. There's a bunch of other cool stuff you can do with uh, that that I'll show you a little later. Let's try this. Remember how I keep talking about mixing and matching? Let's go and uh, see if we can have another demo break because I think demos breaking are more fun than demos working, don't you think? Shall we? I wonder if I should just make a Northwind database just to, just to cleanse the palette. Maybe? No? I just said file new web forms application. And there's my web forms app. But I really want to have MVC in my web forms app. Are there two, are there two like uniquely Bulgarian flavors that go together? Like Americans love peanut butter and chocolate. Like, we think that that's the best thing ever. Right? And then there's like, so like Norwegians, they like, like anchovies and pickles or something. I don't know. What do you guys like? Two things. That, do you guys like peanut butter and chocolate? Because that's like, if you like want to catch an American, like set a trap or whatever, you put like a little peanut butter and a little chocolate. And we'll, we'll walk right into the trap. I think of adding MVC and web forms. It's like peanut butter and chocolate. They go really well together. Let's go and say install package, add MVC, tab. Go out to the internet, come back down, and boom, MVC3 web forms. This is a little experiment I did. I blogged about this. It's not 100% perfect, but it's trying to show it's possible. So watch the solution explorer on the side. Error. <laughs> 0 0.1, 0 0.2. But it compiles, so that red stuff must not be important. <laughs> okay, so there's web forms, and there's MVC, same app. Uh -huh. It's nice, yes. I can go into the global ASAX now, see that that's web forms. Where's all the routing? What's going on? It's chaos. I'm registering the routes in a pluggable area. I can go and say not only routes.map route, but I can say map page route and put in a route for things like about.aspx. Mix and match. You can do it. It's okay. It's a good thing. I could then add in a web API if I wanted to and have my JSON APIs, my MDC part of my app, all looking nice, clean URLs, HTML5, all the way through. Everything works. It would be magical. All these things working together really, really cleanly. It's about ASP.NET. We are listening. We are doing our best. We're trying to open source stuff. One of the things I also want to let you know is that we're not trying to sell you anything. Here's a little secret about Microsoft. They want you to use Windows. Once you use Windows, you can have all this other crap. Web API, open source, MEF, open source, MVC, open source, Orchards, open source, NuGet's, open source, the NuGet Gallery's open source. We're trying to open source as much stuff as we can. Open first, close last. Just use Windows. And buy Office and an Xbox and a Windows phone. But <laughs> All this should hopefully make you feel like this. It's like this. So go out, build something beautiful. Thank you very much. Goodbye. All right, so remember, this is, it's, it's stretchy time now. So let's stretch, let's relax. Jesse Liberty's gonna come up, he's gonna hang out, teach us about Windows Phone. So 10 minute break, don't leave, get some popcorn, and uh, we'll hang out. Are we good? All right, good night, everybody.